manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are title and not name. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is a title that a creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that produce a sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus or Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in His pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine vision and understood in divine revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation. And we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of a holy name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, the devil, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth.
known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, save in the name of Yahshua, the Messiah. And 10, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua, the Messiah, with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. Our scripture lesson this evening will be Joshua, the first chapter, and that will be read by Dr. Delilah Tucker of the Madison, Wisconsin branch. We would like to dedicate class with a prayer from Dr. Jake Piante from the Green Bay, Wisconsin branch. Thank you. Uh, let us all bow our hearts and minds and thank Yashua for bringing us onto Zoom tonight so we can meditate on his gospel and his creation and our salvation and just be thankful that we, we know the true good word and that we continue to hold each other up through these end times and thank him for giving us guidance so we can get through these end times. And with that, let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, I will be reading Joshua, the first chapter. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, it came to pass that Yahweh spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For Yahweh thy Elohim is with thee, whithersoever thy, thou goest. Then Yahshua commanded the officer of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare you visuals. For within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which Yahweh your Elohim giveth you to possess it. And to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to have the tribe of Manasseh spake Yahshua saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded you, saying, Yahweh your Elohim hath given you rest. And hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them. 
until Yahweh hath given your brethren rest, as he hath given you, and they also have possessed the land which Yahweh your Elohim giveth them, then ye shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, Yahweh's servant, gave you on this side Jordan toward the sun rising. And they answered Yahshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only Yahweh thy Elohim be with thee, as he was with Moses. Whithersoever he be that doeth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearken unto thy words in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Joshua, first chapter. Thank you very much. Our scripture readers this evening will please be Dr. Stuellen McGuire of the Madison, Wisconsin branch and Dr. Mike Josephson of the Green Bay, Wisconsin branch. Welcome to everyone tonight. We will try to have a three speaker format with our first speaker that we will call on will be Dr. Gail Josephson of the Green Bay, Wisconsin branch. Hi, um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity um, to attend this class and to speak. Um, it is a great thing to have Yashua on our minds. And um, when we can visit Zoom classes, either, um, well, either on Zoom or YouTube, it's just a wonderful thing that there's just so much um, knowledge and um, lectures out there that we can learn something about our creator, some truth. Um, Michelle, could you just read again that first aim, please, or recite it? Yes. To help you find, know, find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Right. So we want to um, show you how to find and know Yahweh as he really is and actually exists. Because out in the world, people think they know about God and people have a lot of opinions about God. But we can show you um, in the Bible, in the book and in the creation how um, that Yahweh really does exist. And um, just even looking in the creation um, tonight with all the wars going on and forest fires and floodings yesterday, I guess was on the news, um, you know, like who has a hand in all that? And you just think God does, but Yahweh has a purpose that, and a purpose and a pattern that he goes by to show us who he is and that he has a plan of salvation for us. And he made that promise and he has, has to keep it. So um, let's, let's go back into Exodus and then um, I'll show you a few things in, in the scripture. Maybe I can hit a couple things on that too. But um, let's even get um, Exodus, the third chapter, um, because at the time of Moses and this in the scripture reading definitely about Moses and the children of Israel. Um, so it was pretty important to Joshua back there in the Old Test Testament. Um, you know, the first five books were written by Moses, and then he took off the flesh, as they said, in Joshua, the first chapter, and the Joshua took over. So let's get in three and um, maybe um, in 10, because in... Um, i got to just get my screen if I can. Um, here on the Moses chart at the bottom is the, um, the land of Egypt, and that's where the children of Israel were held cap in captivity to the Egyptians. So they were crying on to their God, who they knew was El Shaddai, and um, they wanted to be delivered. And I guess when, no matter what religion you are, before you come down to these lectures, you want to be delivered. You want to have salvation. 
and you know if you believe that there is a God. So um, let's pick it up in three and um, ten, I guess. Uh, let's start at eight, three and eight in Exodus. Exodus 3 and 8. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Okay, thank and, you. Mm -hmm. I meant to stop you before you had to read all those, but oh, you did okay. really well. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so Yahweh's saying that he's going to come down and he's going to deliver the children of Israel. And he's, um, uh, and it says a nine, and what nine read to him. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Right, so he's, um, Yahweh um, had been having a conversation with Moses at the burning bush. And he's saying that he saw that the children of Israel were being oppressed and they were crying out to their Elohim. And Jacob had said, or Jacob had said in the prayer about, um, you know, the brethren holding each other's arms up and being there for each other, because this world is a hard thing. Um, nobody just uh, goes through life, you know, um, just all happy with no problems or no illness or no sadness. Everybody needs to have somebody helping, helping them um, get through life. And here um, the children of Israel were crying on to their Elohim to be delivered. Okay, keep going, please. 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. and, and Moses said unto Elohim, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Okay, so now Moses is just saying, you know, who am I that I would be able to go down there and um, deliver the children of Israel out of their captivity. And Pharaoh was um, just the, you know, the greatest man on earth at that time. So who is he? Um, to go back into Egypt and deliver the children of Israel. All right, keep going. 12. And he said, certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve Yahweh upon his mountain. Upon okay, his mountain. so now, now he, he is, um, Yahweh is telling Moses that he's going to be with Moses and he said, and when you do deliver the children of Israel out of captivity, um, you're going to worship Yahweh at the mountain. Now, um, that is being pretty confident that it was going to happen. And I started out saying that Yahweh has a purpose. And Yahweh, because he has that purpose, and he spoke in his purpose by saying, I'm going to be a deliverer, I'm going to be a savior, he has to do it. So he's saying that the children of Israel have to come out of the land of Egypt. He is going to be a savior. Okay. And he's saying that he's going to be with them. Now, um, now this goes on. We've um, talked about this in, um, throughout our lectures that um, then Yahweh said, or then Moses said unto um, Yahweh Elohim there in the burning bush, he said, well, who am I going to say sent me on to the children of Israel because they're going to say, what God is it? And Yahweh answered, you know, tell them that Yahweh Elohim is going to be the deliverer. And, um, and, and that did happen. And I just want to say about this, um, and I will, uh, and I will be with you um, because, you know, how did that happen? How did God accompany Moses? He said, he's going to be there with him. Okay, so let's get um, 1 Corinthians 10 and 1. And we're going to stay in the Old Testament, too, and I'm going to get into Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, too. And, but let's start with 1 Corinthians, because this is in the New Testament, in case you're a New Testament read, um, reader, that you would, um, I don't know if you've ever run across this. I'm not sure if I ever did in my Catholic upbringing. So go ahead and read that, please. First Corinthians 10. Moreover, brethren, 
I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Okay, keep going. And did eat the same spiritual meat mm -hmm. and did drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that rock that led them and that rock was the Messiah. Okay, so I want to um, work with that a little bit. Uh, and I'm thinking I better get that in my own book. So this is talking about Moses in this coming out of the land of Egypt and then getting to the Red Sea. And uh, on, if you can point to it on the chart where we have Egypt at the bottom and then is the Red Sea is the blue water there. So the children of Israel walked out of Egypt um, after the um, Passover supper, and they were led by a cloud and they went through the Red Sea. And you can kind of see in the middle there that the waters are heaped up and there's a cloud. Yep, and the waters um, uh, were divided there when Moses raised his rod and they were went through the divided waters of the Red Sea. So let's start that again, please, in First Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Okay, now this is pretty important that Paul's saying that he didn't want us to be ignorant of this one thing, or um, that he wasn't really talking to us because I wasn't a Jew back there, but he's saying that he doesn't want people to be ignorant. And he's saying that the children of Israel or his fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, uh, I better get that in Exodus about them going with the cloud. Um, and I think it's probably, I gotta find it unless somebody knows. Um, for uh, 13 and 21 maybe. Okay, Exodus 13 and 21. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Okay, now here is um, the children of Israel, and they're following this cloud and it's a pillar of a cloud by day and it's a pillar of fire by night and they um that cloud was actually um how Yah how Yahweh was going to be with them remember he said that um certainly I will be with you now I, let's get Exodus um 3 and 14 please <clears throat> Exodus 3 and 14. Okay. And Elohim said unto Moses, I will be what I will to be. Okay. Now in the in your Bible, in my Bible, it says, um, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And that is very limiting. Um, you know, um, I, am a, um, a, I am a woman and that's all I am. I can't be anything else. And so if Yah Yahweh is saying that he is, something that's very limiting okay what this actually says in hebrew is i will be what i will to be so whatever he wants to be um, in the purpose that's what he can be so at the beginning of this chapter when i said that um yeah we talked to moses out of the burning bush he will to be a burning bush because there is no way that um, a bush would be burning without being consumed, except that Yahweh was there. Just pick that up at um, three and two, please, Swellen. And the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush <clears throat> was not consumed. Right, and the bush wasn't consumed. So it's the angel of Yahweh there. So it, Yahweh willed to be an angel in that burning bush and spoke to Moses. I, and I guess that's pretty phenomenal too. I made mean, it sound like it was great that the um, bush wasn't being consumed, but um, God talked to Moses out of the bush, okay, so, which is pretty phenomenal. So Yahweh willed to be a burning bush. Yahweh can will to be a cloud and to 
um, bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. So I need um, 1 Corinthians again, please. I hope you guys still have that. No problem. Um, I'll give you time to get it. I got to find it in my book too. So this is um, actually the migration pattern and how the children of Israel left Egypt. And, um, you know, Yahweh goes by a, a, a pattern. We show it there in the wilderness of Sinai. There's a, um, a tabernacle pattern, but there's also a migration pattern that he also goes by. So the children of Israel are being delivered. And here's Paul saying, I don't want you to be ignorant of this one thing. All right, go ahead. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea mm -hmm. and, and were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Okay, so now they talk about a baptism. Now I thought I just had to be baptized in my church. But here it's saying that they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So they, um, there's a, a cloud, which would be a heavenly thing, and the sea, which would be an earthly. Okay, keep going. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? Mm -hmm. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that led them, and that rock was the Messiah. Okay, and that rock was Yahshua, the Messiah. And they're saying, and they drank of that spiritual rock, and um, that that they followed it, actually. So that rock, you can look up um, the word, I think that the word cloud means rock. Also, if you look up and get the um, the etymology, okay, one, one shows forth the other one, okay, so which is kind of Kind of a neat principle in that rocks and clouds are the same. So they followed that cloud out of the land of Egypt. And Yahweh willed to be a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of fire by night. And that pillar of fire um, went be, um, between them and the children, of, or between them and the Egyptians. So they had protection from that fiery cloud. And I think I want to get that if. If you want to keep um, hold your place though in First Corinthians, because I might need that, because they didn't work with the all of it. But in um, Exodus, I want to get that the cloud was between them and the Egyptians, and I think that might be in fourteen. Yeah, fourteen and tw nineteen and twenty. Exodus 14 and 19. Mm -hmm. And the angel of Yahweh, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Okay, now it's talking about the angel of Yahweh is in that pillar of a cloud. So that is that rock that they followed. Um, out of Egypt that it talked about in First Corinthians. And um, I think there's scriptures that you can pick up that Yahshua is the rock besides um, right there. So here that the angel of Yahweh um, will to be that pillar of a cloud. All right, keep going. 20. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Mm -hmm. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it mm -hmm. gave light by night to these so that the one came not near the other all the night. Okay, so if you can imagine the children of Israel being on the Egyptian side of the Red Sea, and they want to go into the wilderness, which Yahweh told them that when they arrive, they will worship him at the mountain. But they're, they have a, a water in front of them, and they have the Egyptians behind them. But it's saying here that there was a cloud and it says that it was a cloud and darkness to them, meaning the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to these. So it was um, by uh, light to the Israelites. Okay, so it was darkness to the Egyptians. It was light um, to the Israel's, Israelites. And that's how um, they passed through the Red Sea. And then uh, let's read 21, please. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all the night. 
and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. Okay, so they went through dry land through the Red Sea and the waters were divided and they passed over and went into the wilderness of Sinai. But when the children or when the Egyptians followed, that Red Sea closed up and they they were drowned. Okay, Pharaoh and his hosts were all taken away. So this cloud was, I, I will be what I will to be. Yahweh came down and he was with the children of Israel. Now I want to get um, Numbers, the 14th chapter, and I want to show how that this man, um, Joshua, who we talk about in the first chapter of Joshua, um, um, how he came about. Uh, so let's read in Numbers 14. Now this is when um, they're already in the wilderness of Sinai and the, after they passed through the Red Sea and Moses had them, um, had 12 people going up and checking out Canaan's land to see if they were able to conquer um, all those, the Hittites and the Perizzites and all of them that I had to well and read those names. They were going to see if they could overcome them so that they could settle in Canaan's land because Yahweh had ultimately promised them um, Canaan or the promised land, as it says on that chart in the green area there. So, um, he, he, in this chapter in Numbers, he's telling about the, four, uh, the 12 people that are going up. One man from a tribe are going to go up there and spy out the land. So I want to get, uh, go ahead. We do know where it is, Mike. 13. Yep. Yeah, 13. 13 and 3. Okay. And Moses, by commandment of Yahweh, sent them from the wilderness, wilderness of Paran, and those men were heads of the children of Israel. Okay, so um, uh, in here, the Israelites, there's 12 tribes, and they're the sons of Jacob, and they each have a name, and um, uh, they might be labeled there underneath those white tents there. But I want to skip down to um, the ones that I want to talk about. So let's pick up in six, first of all, and then eight. Of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Okay, so out of the tribe of Judah, um, there was a man called Caleb, and he's going to be one of the um, one of the spies that they talk about later. Okay, now read eight. And of the tribe of Ephraim, mm -hmm. Oshea, the son of Nun. Okay, now out of the tribe, here's another tribe, and it's Ephraim, and he's calling Oshea, the son of Nun, uh, the son of Nun. Now. Um, there was no descendant of Ephraim called Nun, but let's read down um, at 16. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. Okay, there's one man out of each of those 12 tribes, okay. And Moses called Oshea, the son of Nun, Yehoshua. Yeah, right, okay, so now Moses um, has seen this man out of the tribe of Ephraim, and was the son of nobody, the son of none. And Moses changed that man's name uh, from Oshia to Yashua. Uh, Yashua. In, in, in my book, it says J-E and then Hoshua, but it, there was no J. The moderator had already told us that there is no letter J in the English language, the Greek, the Hebrew, the Latin language. There is no J. So he was called Yashua, the son of none. OK, and um, the book of Joshua, that's really an error because there was no J at the time when um, Joshua, the first chapter was written. There was no letter J then. He was known as Yashua. Now, Yashua, the son of Nun, is to the minister is um, to Moses. And on that um, the plateau of that burning or on top of the, the plateau of Mount Sinai, there's Moses with the the table of stones in his hand and he's got them raised over his head and it says Moses name on there and the man next to him it's called Yashua so Yashua was with them with them him while he was throwing the tables of stone there and if you can just point to the top of the mountain um yep where Moses yep there's Moses and he's looking there um 
that first incorporeal form where it has a ghost-like shape and form of a man, that was also that was actually um, Yahshua there transforming into a body and then into a tabernacle. And well, let's read in Exodus, the 24th chapter. We'll just do that quick. And I'm almost done here. Exodus 24 and 13 or 16, I think it is. Okay. 13 is Moses rose up and his minister, Yahshua. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exodus 24, 13. And Moses rose, rose up and his minister, Yahshua. And mm -hmm. Moses went up into the Mount of Elohim. And he said unto, unto the elders, tarry you here for us until we come again to you. And mm -hmm. behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If okay, any but um, this is Moses. He's giving instructions to the people that were staying down below. But him and his minister, Yahshua, went up into the mountain. Now, um, I let me think. I wanted to um, tie in about, oh, I want to get an ex, uh, Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter. Because you need to know this, too. Four in... Um, let's see, 12, 11, 4 and 11. Deuteronomy 4 and 11. And he came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire into the midst of heaven with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. Okay, now this is um, my title of um, the little subtitle before this says Israel's Experience at Horeb. So this is when the children of Israel at, are at the base of the mountain and they're seeing Moses going up into the mountain. And it says that there is um, uh, it, uh, fire and darkness and clouds and thick darkness. That's why we have this um, cloud as a burning cloud of fire where it says Yahweh is spirit and Moses is in there and it's a burning cloud because here it says that that cloud was a burning cloud. Now Moses and Yahshua went up in there, and when the children of Israel um, saw that Moses wasn't coming down, and it was getting to be 40 days and 40 nights, and Moses still wasn't coming, they're thinking, this guy's dead. You know, here he is up in a, a burning cloud. Now, um, one, one thing that I want to bring home, do I still have like five minutes, or do I get a little bit more time? You have about seven or eight minutes. Okay, great. Okay, now, one thing I want to tell you about is that, um, you know, with all these forest fires going on in California, um, there, there are um, trees there known as the redwoods, and the greatest trees of the redwood category are called the sequoias. Now, the sequoias don't burn with, with fires that are going through there. And um, one of our members had just gotten back, two of our members just got back from um, a trip to see the sequoias. And they saw how there were just trunks standing there, but everything else was burned out. And the sequoias can withstand fire. And it, um, it's common knowledge that fire doesn't burn fire. And somebody had just mentioned this before class and it's like, wow, that was so pertinent because we just heard this at Friday night's class in Green Bay. And um, Moses and Yahshua were up in that burning book or burning cloud. And we want to be in the bosom of the father or the bosom of Yahweh so that we can withstand the day of Yahweh. And um, let's get Matthew, the third chapter, please. Because we had talked about earlier that Moses and the children of Israel were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. But now there's a different baptism going on um, after Yahshua, the Messiah, was um, uh, crucified, he was buried, and he was resurrected, okay? And now there is a, a new covenant going on, and it's a spiritual covenant. And I, you know, the one place where it kept talking about everything was spiritual was that, um, where Mike was reading, you know, they did eat the same spiritual drink and ate or um, spiritual food and drank the spiritual um, 
drink, you know, it's like, uh, how do we get to that point? Okay. It's because Yahshua resurrected from the dead and he poured out his Holy Spirit. So let's get Matthew um, third chapter, please. And 11. Matthew three and 11. Mm -hmm. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but mm -hmm. he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose mm -hmm. shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay, He's now John's talking about a baptism that he was doing with water. And he's talking about another that's going to come. And he's going to, that the new one, the, the, the other that's coming after him, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, how are you going to withstand a baptism of fire, except that you be with the fire? that Yahshua is going to put his flame of fire right within us. And I think when they received the Holy Spirit, it was in little tongues of fire. Um, and it sat on each of them, as it says in Acts, the second chapter. Okay, so we want to be with the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and uh, there's places in, in Hebrews where it says that Yahweh is a consuming fire, where he's going to just... Um, uh, Actually, are you still in Matthew 3? Let's read 12. 12. Whose yep. fan is in his hand, and mm -hmm. he will thoroughly purge his floor and mm -hmm. gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Right. So the one that's going to be baptizing with the Holy Spirit and with fire, he's going to burn away the chaff and he's going to um, purge the floor. He's going to um, clean up the floor, and he's going to burn up at everything that isn't um, needed. And with the wildfires, um, the wildfires are needed for the sequoia trees. Now, I'm not saying all these thousands of acres that are being destroyed right now, that it's a great thing. It's a terrible thing. When the sequoias, um, but the sequoias do need a fire um, so that they can um, produce their seed. And that also they need to purge the floor of the forest where the sequoias are, because all that vegetation underneath it, um, underneath those trees, it's competing for um, the sunlight for a new seed. So the sequoia drops the pine cones. It needs the fire to release the seed out of that pine cone. And then um, I was reading some stuff online and it said that um, the seed needs a lot of water it needs sunlight and it needs um, no competition um, from the surrounding vegetation. So that surrounding vegetation needs to be burned off. So when that's being burned off and the seeds released, um, there's no vegetation around it. So that seed can get um, water and the sunlight and it can form a new tree. And um, just like the, the wheat in the garner, it's going to, have all that chaff burned away and Yahshua is going to burn off some of the burn off the stuff that is not needed within us um, that's why life is hard because he's constantly cleaning us up you know fire is a um a way to clean things too you can you know you can clean um I clean my frying pans um uh, with fire and water on my cast iron pans so that they become clean because I can't put it in soap and water or I can't put it in soap, soapy water. So a fire is a cleansing and a fire takes care of all the dead and the unwanted matter or vegetation that's on this earth plane. So Yahweh's a consuming fire. He's going to just have, um, he's going to um, clean up uh, so that we can become presentable to our father. He makes us as um, chaste virgins, actually, um, is what it says in Hebrews. And um, this in Joshua, when he's talking about, um, he's going to lead them over into Canaan's land. That is Joshua himself, that he had, I will be the warrior. And he's going to go into Canaan's land and lead them. You know, when the children of Israel went to fight in Canaan's land, they they were not a powerful army. They had Yahshua who said, I will be with you. And I, he will take care of um, all their needs. And he would take care of winning their battles for them. 
So um, this first chapter um, was is pretty interesting and in how Yahshua took them over. He replaced Moses, took them over into Canaan's land. And that is the promised land. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. And that's just the type of where we want to be in, in the bosom of our father. And in, um, you know, where people say you know, going to heaven or um, eternal life, that would be what the children of Israel experienced when they went, when they crossed the river Jordan. And, um, and, and, I, I just want to end it there because um, there's other stories I, I could get into uh, to show you could ask me after class, but um, thank you. I'm just going to um, um, say thank you for letting me tell you this and I'll praise this go to Yahshua the Messiah. Thank you. Thank you very much. For our next speaker, we would like to invite Dr. Mildred Felder. And whatever time you do not use the whole period, we'll just give the Sasha. Oh, yeah. Would you like to have anything to say, Mildred? Uh, no, thanks. Okay, then we'll pass it on to the president of our Madison, Wisconsin branch, Dr. Sasha Rachmeliavich. So good evening, everyone. Can you hear me well? We hear you well. Well, I really enjoyed what uh, the first speaker had to say, and I will continue along the same lines. So when you look at this Moses chart, which is before you, is this chart, among other things, it, as it was said, it depicts the exodus of children of Israel from Egypt, from Egypt to the wilderness of Sinai, and then to Canaan's land. Now, uh, to understand the purpose of Yahweh. We have to uh, go uh, to Romans 1, 19 and 20. So let's go to Romans 1, 19 and 20. Romans 1, 19. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. For Yahweh hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Right. So what uh, we are reading here in Romans is that to understand our creator, to understand Yahweh or his uh, spiritual principles, we have to go to the examples because he created everything, including the history in the Bible, which we read uh, here, to explain himself and to explain his purpose. And his purpose is going according to this pattern so this is the tabernacle pattern, which we introduced in the moderation, which has three compartments, most holy place, holy place, and court round about. And what you see on this big chart, which we called Moses chart, is the same pattern. It's just with the, uh, which uh, Yahweh uh, built, not man, so it's the pattern which is reflected uh, in the uh, Bible story of Exodus of children of Israel. But it goes according to the same pattern. We have Egypt as a court roundabout. We have a holy place. Uh, please go back to Moses' uh, chart, please. We have a holy place at the wilderness of Sinai. 
and we have a cannon's land on most holy place. So what does it reflect? Now, according to Romans 1, 19 and 20, the physical reveals or explains spiritual. So we are dealing with the story of Exodus with the physical uh, Israel. And Israel were chosen people by Yahweh, chosen after the flesh. So the physical Israel or people chosen after the flesh, they reflect spiritual Israel or uh, people reflected after the spirit or the true believers in uh, Yahshua. Let's go to Romans 2, 28, 29, please. So this is the foundation, but it's important uh, to understand what we are going to talk after that. Romans 2, 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of Yahweh. Right. So the physical Jews and the physical circumcision, it, they are allegories of uh, the spiritual Jews and spiritual circumcision. Now, this exodus of children of Israel from Egypt to the wilderness of Sinai to the Canaan's land, it's the exodus of the spiritual Israel or of the invisible Israel or on individual level of our soul from uh, spiritual Egypt to spiritual wilderness of Sinai to the spiritual Canaan's land. Now, Egypt, it was the place where children of Israel were in slavery. They were oppressed by Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh in the book of Ezekiel, I believe, is likened to the dragon. So Pharaoh is the type of Satan. So children of Israel being in the bondage of Satan and Egyptians, a type and shadows of us or our soul being in slavery to the prince of this world, as Satan is called in the Bible, and the satanic spirits. So then what's happened, it's that Yahweh gives his name to Moses, and Yahweh through Moses delivers uh, children of Israel uh, from Egypt, which would be uh, likened to us hearing the true gospel of our salvation, or gospel of Yahshua the Messiah, and uh, being delivered, you know, you know, from the world, which we didn't hear the truth, to the place which we, we can hear the truth and learn about the truth. So what was happening in the wilderness of Sinai, and I'm given a really a kind of broad picture of that. We can go in many details about every each of these uh, so-called compartments or stages. But what happens in the wilderness of Sinai is that people are receiving the laws. So like we come into classes where the true gospel is being preached, the gospel being revealed from heaven by Yahweh to our founder and then uh, delivered to us so we can share the same uh, gospel. So uh, we uh, come to class and we uh, learn about Yahweh's ways, like children of Israel, we're learning about this mosaic, so-called mosaic laws or uh, or covenant or uh, uh, commandments of Yahweh. Now, what, what happened also in the wilderness of Sinai 
is that they were wandering for uh, 40 years in the wilderness. And the first generation of Israelites didn't make it to the Canaan's land, except Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb. I mean, from those who were numbered among the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt, 20 men of war and older. But what? But there is still a multitude of people uh, went to the Canaan's land. So who were these people? These people were the children of the first generation, spiritually showing uh, the principle of being born again, that the firstborn does not receive inheritance. Firstborn here being our uh, soul, the way it's raised under this Pharaoh or under, under the uh, uh, Satan or under the principles and traditions of this world and being shaped in iniquity. This, our carnal soul or our sinful soul has to be changed, has to be converted, has to be uh, born again, as Yashua told Nicodemus. And the second generation of uh, uh, the children of Israel would be likened to this renewed soul. And then the next stage is that they're going through, uh, through the waters of River Jordan in the Canaan's land, which is also called promised land. And that's where the children of Israel receive their inheritance from the physical standpoint which was promised to the forefather uh, Abraham before the children of Israel were even born and came to Egypt, uh, which shows spiritually, as it says in, uh, uh, let's go to uh, Ephesians uh, 1 and I think 3 and 4. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be Yahweh, the Father of, of Yahshua the Messiah, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in the Messiah. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Continue on, please. Having predestinated us. What? Having predestinated yeah, go us. Go ahead, please. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Yahshua the Messiah to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise. Right. Of uh, to the praise of uh, and uh, glory. I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't have time to, uh, you know, to go to all the scriptures. I just want to make this point that he has chosen us before the foundation of the world that he can bring us to his salvation or to the kingdom of Yahweh or to the eternal life or to the spiritual Canaan's land. The same way as we read in uh, Genesis 15 chapter, he predestined the children of Israel after they went to uh, slavery in Egypt to be brought up and come with a great substance and inherit this Canaan's land. So there are several principles of entering the Canaan's land. So why I'm skipping uh, Egypt and why I'm skipping the wilderness of uh, Sinai and talking about Canaan's land because of the scripture reading. The scripture reading, it's talking about uh, Joshua or Yahshua, son of Nun, as was already uh, beautifully explained by the previous speaker. Uh, so Yahshua, son of Nun, is replacing Moses. Moses didn't make it 
to Kenan's land. He died uh, in, in the bound of uh, Nebo, and Yasha is taken over to take uh, uh, children of Israel, second generation, to the Canaan's land. So, and well, you know, I'll, I'll talk about several principles uh, about that, uh, depending how much uh, time I will have. So, one of the principles here is that, uh, you know, before going to the Canaan's land, or uh, before inheriting eternal life, uh, we need to uh, get the deal. So we, we cannot do it with a mediator. So Yasha himself uh, has to do it. So before going there, let me illustrate a point that this pattern of uh, uh, migration of children of Israel from Egypt to Canaan's land actually fits with the pattern of the salvation of the soul. And where would I like to um, go to witness that? It's Matthew 13th chapter. I will need uh, verse 23. So before reading verse 23, in the beginning of the chapter, Yahshua is uh, telling his disciples a parable about the sower and the seed. So the sower is placing the seed uh, in the ground, and then the seed is uh, uh, coming up from the uh, ground, and there are different scenarios uh, taking place. The seed or the plant doesn't always end up in fruition. But if it comes to the good ground, the seed, it grows and then it brings forth uh, fruits. And, in the, and the uh, disciples couldn't understand what Yasha means by that, although he told them this is the parable of the kingdom. And he explains them the meaning of this parable, uh, starting, well, on this particular part when the seed comes to the good ground, in verse 23. Matthew 13, 23. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Another right, so if, yeah, I'm sorry, that's, that's what I need. Thank you. So if you look at this uh, chart on the Moses chart, so you will see that uh, the seed comes to the ground. It would be uh, like children of Israel, which is the seed of Abraham uh, coming to Egypt. And Egypt has a you know, dark black color, like a ground, like earth. So a seed coming into the ground, it was like a children of uh, Israel coming to Egypt. It's also likened to the preaching of the gospel, to the word of Yahweh coming to our soul. And that's what happens uh, next. It's, it's resurrect or it's that uh, germinating, which would be likened to crossing of the Red Sea. And then this plant, it starts growing. So it, this would be likened to the wilderness of Sinai. And this would be a uh, like into the children of Israel, uh, growing into the knowledge of Yahweh's commandments, or us growing into percepts and uh, of uh, of the gospel, like uh, Yahshua is the true name; it's not Jesus. Uh, our Creator is unity; it's not Trinity. Yahshua came to fulfill uh, the covenant, not to institute to fulfill old covenant not to institute water baptism or Lord's Supper, and so forth. But when we read before, there are different scenarios can take place in the wilderness of Sinai, and this plant or this tree may not end up in fruition. However, if it comes to the good ground, so the tree is uh, growing, and that it will end, will end up bringing forth fruits, bringing forth fruits, 
the principle is to be alive or to give life, to multiply. So this would be a principle of, uh, uh, you know, being in, uh, in the kingdom of uh, Yasha. And uh, so it typifies by children of Israel going to the Canaan's land or us receiving the Holy Spirit. And according to uh, the parable, which Yashu explains, it's when the person hears the gospel and understands it. So that's what's important. So that's between the wilderness and the Canaan's land. It has to be, you know, you know, the, the understanding or spiritual revelation of Yahshua the Messiah or receiving of the Holy Spirit. It's all uh, pretty much the same uh, things. So to have this spiritual understanding, we, the, the mediator uh, cannot give us, like Moses couldn't bring them to the Canaan's land. It's only uh, Joshua or Yahshua, son of Nun, could do it. In a similar way, we uh, read uh, Already, uh, uh, Gail read it in uh, Matthew 3rd chapter, Matthew 3.11, when John the Baptist is saying that I indeed baptize you uh, by, uh, with water, but he who comes after me, he is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and the fire, pointing, uh, pointing out to Yahshua, the Messiah. Now, Moses did baptize children of Israel uh, in water, you know, or in uh, Red Sea. He was like a figure of um, uh, John the Baptist. We can read about it uh, in uh, First Corinthians 10th chapter. I mean, we don't have time to read it, but it says that they were baptized uh, uh, into Moses, into the, uh, into the sea, children of uh, Israel. So there is a parallel between Moses and Yahshua, son of Nun, and uh, uh, John the Baptist and uh, Yahshua, uh, the Messiah. So there's a parallel in the law, but there is also parallel in the prophets. So let's go to First uh, Kings 18 chapter, and I will need uh, start reading with verse 31. So before we read there, we're talking about uh, the contest on the Mount of Carmel between uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. We don't have time to read the whole story, but it was a contest. Uh, uh, Elijah told them to make a, uh, a sacrifice, make altar, and uh, make it you know, the altar burnt with uh, uh, fire. So uh, if uh, the Baal is the true Elohim or true God, then he's going to make it. But if uh, Yahweh is uh, true Elohim, he is going to do it. And as much as the prophets of Baal tried to cause this uh, fire, uh, they uh, couldn't do it. They were praying, they were cutting their uh, hands, but nothing worked out because it has to be done by a, a prescribed way. And uh, that's what we did happened, uh, the Elijah uh, did. First Kings 18.31. And Elijah took the 12 stones according to the numbers of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto the word of Yahweh came, saying, Israel shall be, be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of Yahweh. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid it upon the wood and, and said, Fill four barrels with water, 
pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran about the altar, and, he, and it filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Yahweh Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, I'm sorry, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art the Elohim in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Yahweh, hear me, that this people may know that thou art Yahweh Elohim, that does turn their hearts back again. And then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Thank you. Now that's uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, reading this. So 12 stones put on the altar. The stones symbolize the children of Israel. And uh, Elijah was pouring water on these stones. He was baptizing the Israel in water. But then Yahweh came and he baptized the stones or in figure children of Israel with fire. So that's, you know, it's another reflection of, uh, you know, I will baptize you with water, but he who comes after me, pointing out to Yahshua, uh, the Messiah, who is not different from Yahweh or Yahweh Elohim. He is Yahweh Elohim. He baptized Israel with the spirit and with the fire. And what does it mean from the spiritual standpoint? From the spiritual standpoint, there are ministers of Yahshua the Messiah in this school who baptize us people who come to class with water. So what do I mean by that? I don't mean physical water. In the Bible, the water, it's Romans 1, 19 and 20, is the type of uh, the word. Like in uh, John 15 and 3, for example, Yahshua said, you already cleaned by the word which I spoke unto you. So the ministers of Yahshua preach in the gospel or baptize, you know, the soul of the people, uh, you know, with, uh, with the true gospel. But it doesn't make these people to enter the Canaan's land. Why? Because to enter the Canaan's land, it has to be a spiritual understanding. They have to be baptized with the uh, Holy uh, Spirit, and it can do, uh, it can be done only by Yahshua, because he is the only one who uh, can give a, a revelation. Uh, as a, a confirmation, and there are many places to go, but as a confirmation, uh, let's go to First Corinthians 3 and 5. So Paul is talking to the assembly in Corinth. First Corinthians 3 and 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as Yahweh gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but Yahweh gave the increase. So, then, so and that's, yeah, continue on, sorry. So mm -hmm. then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but Yahweh that giveth the increase. Right, because we always give all praise and glory to Yahweh through Yahshua the Messiah, because he is the one who gives the increase, like in this parable, uh, about the soul and the seed, 
to give increase to bear forth fruits. And in 15th chapter of, uh, uh, of John, he said, with, uh, you cannot bear fruit uh, without me. So he is making us, you know, bearing fruits. So that's one of the uh, main principles which we see, you know, uh, when people uh, go, you know, from spiritual wilderness to the Canaan's land. Uh, as we kind of read this reflection in the first uh, chapter of, uh, of Joshua. So another uh, principle is uh, what actually happened at the time when they crossed uh, the river Jordan. You know, the, the Bible is, you know, filled with this, uh, you know, beautiful jots which help us understand and appreciate uh, the wisdom of Yahweh and his beauty and uh, his mercy to us so he can uh, reflect and explain uh, his purpose. So let's go to uh, Joshua third chapter and let's read verse 16. So I have like five minutes left, is it right? Yeah. Michelle? Thank you. Who's reading? 315? It's 316. Okay. So before you start reading 316, what happens here, it just children of Israel came to uh, the river Jordan and they're going to cross this river Jordan, and there is a specific uh, way and specific place, uh, rather, they cross in this river, and that's what we're reading right now. Joshua 3.16, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of city Adam, that is beside Zeratan. And those that came down towards the sea to the, of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right on, against Jericho. Right. So the people passed. No, that's, that's what I need because I, I just don't have time to go uh, in uh, other details. But we have like three... Uh, uh, proper names there. So about how these waters uh, parted and let the uh, uh, children of Israel go. So the waters were at the city of, uh, near the city of Adam. So if you look up Adam, Adam means a man. A man. That's, uh, if you, you can look it up in Strong's. And it says it was near Zaritan. So if you look, look up Zaritan in Strong's, the meaning of Zaritan is to pierce. And then it says it ends up in a, a salt uh, sea. And the salt sea and salt means to vanish, to disappear to dust. And it's the same sea as the dead sea. It's another name for the salt sea. Mm -hmm. So what has to happen, again, there is a symbolism in the names, that the man or our uh, carnal man has to be pierced or has to be cut and has to die. Like, and that's what happened uh, on the day of uh, uh, Pentecost. If we read in Acts 2.37, so we read how uh, Peter, after receiving the Holy Spirit, is preaching the gospel uh, to, uh, to the uh, other devout man. And that's what we read in 237. I'm sorry, where did you want? Acts 237. Okay. Acts 2.37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, 
and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So, and these men, they were uh, pricked or cut in their heart. If you look it up, it's the same as pierced in their heart. And that's what's going to happen because they're going to receive the Holy Spirit as we read in the end of this chapter. So the old man will, uh, will have to die and, uh, uh, or will be renewed uh, by, you know, by the Spirit. And that's what Paul the Apostle is uh, saying. That's what, what's happening with our soul when it uh, leaves spiritual Egypt, when it wanders in the wilderness, and when Yahshua gives a spiritual understanding or revelation, or when Yahshua, son of man, or Yahshua, son, uh, Yahshua the Messiah, under this new covenant, being the quickening spirit or life-giving spirit, is taking us over to his kingdom. That's what's happening. The last scripture and time done. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Second. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any fa any man be in the Messiah, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Right. So our old man is crucified with Yahshua the Messiah. Is Galatians two and twenty, and all things are new, and we are in the righteousness peace and joy or in the Canaan's land. So praise be to Yashua. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We would like to ask our next speaker to be Dr. Dennis Volpe, Dean of the Oceanside, California branch. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we yes, hear you. Fine. All right, let me know if my sound cuts in and out. Uh, I don't know if it will or won't, so uh, let me know. Hopefully, we can. Uh, I can give this a uh, little uh, testimony without uh, without it being interrupted. Now, as I was sitting there listening to the first two speakers. And thinking about the scripture reading tonight, it, it brought back to me something that I think is a very interesting correlation. Now we know that Yahshua, the son of Nun, as Dr. Kinley said, was the son of Nun after the flesh. That truly was Yahweh Elohim himself that had materialized they're in the midst of Israel and walk with those Israelites. And his job was to, uh, I'll say it like this, take the baton from Moses and carry forth the people to bring them into their inheritance. And in the first chapter, it talks about Joshua uh, being the one that will uh, uh, give the inheritance to each one of the tribes which is what happened. Now, if you read very carefully in the 24th chapter of Joshua, you'll see that, and Dr. Kinley pointed this out to us, you would have, we would have never caught this just reading the Bible on our own. In fact, let's go over there to the 24th chapter for a minute, starting at verse 1, I believe. Joshua 24 and 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before Yahweh. All right, now listen, and before Josh we... I'm sorry for interrupting. Before we uh, read into this, uh, I just got a flash that came across the wire that I wanted... Something else I wanted to work with, I should work with it first and then take you over here after. I want to talk about 
when they went into the land of Canaan. And they had to conquer, the first thing that they conquered was the city of Jericho. Now Jericho was a city that was encased within a wall, a great wall that went all the way around the city. And when Yahshua went up there, Yahweh Elohim instructed him to have the priest blow these trumpets. And they had to go around, walk around that city for seven days. And they had to remain, remain quiet while they did this. They didn't say anything. But the seventh day, they were commanded, when Yahweh gave them the so-called uh, go-ahead, they were commanded to shout a mighty shout. And what transpired is the walls of Jericho fell. They were brought down. And that city was the mightiest city in the land of Canaan at that time. Now, what this shows you is this. First of all, two things that I want to point out. In the wilderness of Sinai, when Yahweh Elohim had sent the spies over, uh, had Moses send the spies over into the land of Canaan. And we all know the story, how that Joshua, or Yahshua the son of Nun, and Caleb went over there with the other ten spies. When they came back, the ten spies gave a report, ten of the spies gave a report, that there were giants in that land and they were too mighty and we can't overcome them. Now Joshua and Caleb, of course, reminded the people what Yahweh did down in the land of Egypt and that he could overcome them and that he would fight for them. Now the people went with the ten spies instead of went with the testimony of Joshua and Caleb and therefore did not have faith that Yahweh would give him, give them their inheritance. Now this was the first generation. Now what Yahweh did, because they didn't believe the true report and did not have faith, he disinherited them. He told them that their carcasses would die in the wilderness and that they would not go over into the land that he swore to their forefathers because of their unbelief. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what it amounts to is that the people were unwilling to fight. They were unwilling to fight to gain their inheritance. Now, what happened is, as you already know, the first generation died off. I think that was talked about tonight. And there was a second generation that was a figure of the second born those that are born again. The first generation, Yahweh actually named them down in the land of Egypt as being his firstborn son. But the second generation were a figure of those that were born again after the Spirit, as Sasha had pointed out tonight. Now, what is going to happen is, they're going to go into that land of Canaan, and they have to be ready to war, to go to war with those tribes up there. Now, what he did is he took down, Yahweh Elohim took down that whole city, that fortress of Jericho. Now, let's look at what that's pointing to. Now, we've got that figure of Canaan's land as the most holy place in a type and a shadow. And, of course, the wilderness would be the holy place in Egypt, the court roundabout. Now, the most holy place in your body is your head cavity. And just like in the land of Canaan, they were full of those, uh, I'll use the term as it was used in the Bible, not being derogatory, unclean Gentiles. They were considered to be unclean. They were a figure of those demonic spirits that had come in and taken residence in the land that was once Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sworn to them by Yahweh Elohim there to Abraham. And now the whole area or the whole Canaan's land was overrun with these inhabitants. I'll, I'll refer to them in the type and shadow. They are a type and a shadow of those demonic spirits cast out of heaven. Now, 
they're going to have to take that area through battle and overcome the hold that that mystery of iniquity had. Now, they shouldn't be afraid of that because that's exactly what Yahweh did down in the land of Egypt. Now, Pharaoh in the land of Egypt was incarnate with the devil himself, with Lucifer, resisting Yahweh. And Yahweh overcame him, as you saw, but there was no battle where the Israelites had to take up arms and fight against the Egyptians. Yahweh took down Pharaoh without the uh, Israelites lifting a sword. Not even a sword. Now when they get into the wilderness of Sinai, Yahweh organized them all in armies. And those armies were trained and prepared now to go into the land of Canaan to fight. Now the first generation didn't have to fight in the land of Canaan, and they certainly weren't agreeable to going and fighting in the land of Canaan. Because they were unwilling to fight, because they didn't believe the true report or the promise that Yahweh gave them to give them that land, they were disinherited. The second generation that is going up in there is going to have to fight, and did fight. Now Yahweh took down a stronghold up there in that land of Canaan. What that is a figure of is your head cavity. Your head cavity is overrun by the influences of demonic spirits that were cast out of the angelic before you know the truth. Before you have the Holy Spirit, before you know the truth, you got those demonic spirits running rampant in your heart and mind, whether you believe that or not. Whether you, and listen, it's done in a way that you're not even aware of it. That's how subtle the deception is. Now, can you hear me okay still? Anybody hear me? It's okay. You're a little All in right. and out, but most of what you're hearing. All right, because something flashed on my screen, and that's probably coming from YouTube. But anyhow, so what happens is this. That city called Jericho, one of the uh, uh, definitions that were given for the city Jericho in Young's Concordance was it means moon city. Moon. Now, we know, go over to the A. Asherah chart for a minute, please. Repeat that. Go over to the A. Asherah chart, please. Callie. Thank you. There you go. Now, on the Ea Asher Ea chart, if you look at the two tabernacles, one tabernacle is a tabernacle of the mystery of righteousness, and the other one is the tabernacle of the mystery of iniquity. Now, inside the tabernacle is the outline or silhouette of a woman, showing that both mysteries have a bride. The bride is a, 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 a congregation of souls. Now, in the mystery of righteousness, the bride is in light or daylight because she has the, the, the sun up above her head, shining brightly. And under her feet, you will see it's that she had the moon under her feet. Now, this chart is painted a little bit uh, differently than the original, but nevertheless, she has the moon under her feet. If you look at the very bottom, you've got the full moon there. Now... That's taken from Revelations, where the you know she's the uh, she's uh, clothed in the righteousness of the sun, and the moon is under her feet. Now, what that symbolizes is the light or the sun represents you being in the light of the knowledge of the gospel of Yahweh and salvation, that you're walking in light, not in darkness, and that the moon represents the flesh. It represents a reflection. Of sunlight. Now, you know the moon doesn't actually have light. It's a reflection of sunlight that you see at night. Now, that shows forth that the physical creation is a type and a shadow. It's a Romans 1, 19 and 20. It's not the reality of Yahweh's purpose. It's a reflection of spiritual principles. When you don't see those principles being carnally minded before 
you will come down to a class and have the Holy Spirit quicken your heart and mind and open these things up to you, you are in captivity or living in darkness with the moonlight guiding you. But in that, if you look at that mystery of iniquity, the woman that is inside his tabernacle has the moon above her head. And under her feet, the sun is eclipsed by the moon, meaning it's blotted out by the moon. Now, what the mystery of iniquity wants you to believe is that the physical is the reality, that that spiritual, oh, you don't have to worry about that. You know, you'll, you'll learn all about that after you're dead. Live for, the, live for the here and now. Dedicate your life to the things of this life so that you get all the best kind of things you can have to be comfortable in this life. That's what the mystery of iniquity wants you to do. And ignore Yahweh. Ignore the preparation of your soul in a righteous spiritual state. So he's got these people in the world in darkness. They don't know anything about Yahweh. They are ignorant of Yahweh, how he actually is truthfully exist and certainly they are ignorant of his purpose and plan and they are living believing that the physical is the real reality the moon is over her head and the sun is being blotted out by the moon which means the physical is taking priority over their spiritual reality or their soul now what happens when you come into class the same thing that happened when Joshua was up there, bringing down the land of Canaan, and uh, the, the land of Canaan, bringing down the city of Jericho, which means Moon City. There were walls up. Now we walk in the door, many of us. Some of you are born when you were born, uh, were raised in class. You have a little different situation, and 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 that you could thank Joshua for that. But those of us that were raised in the world, and were basically taught a religious doctrine. We were in captivity to ignorance. We were in ignorance of Yahweh. And when we walk in the door, many of us have walls up that we say, ah, this, this man had a vision, they claim. Oh, I don't believe that. Don't believe that. That's crazy. Oh, he's just a nut job. Claims he had a vision. And that's what people think when they walk in the door. Now, Dr. Kinley was aware that people would think he was a nut job, claiming to have this vision. He's not the only one that it walks around in the earth plane, especially even tonight, this night, that are claiming they're talking to God and they're having visions. But see, the difference is that Dr. Kinley said, I don't want you to believe me. He said, I want you to make me prove it to your satisfaction. And if I can't prove it to your satisfaction, he used to say, you got no business believing it. Now, he never asked us to believe him. But nevertheless, he also wanted us to know where the knowledge that he was going to give us, where it originated or where it came from. Now here's what happens once you come into class. You make a transition from walking with total unconsciousness of Yahweh, how he actually is and truthfully exists in his ever-presence, to walking in a realization of everything that you're looking at now in the physical is a type and a shadow of the spiritual reality of Yahweh. And you now realize that all it is is a reflection of the true sunlight. And when you walk in that state, you now walk with the sun over your head. You're walking in the light of day and you have the moon under your feet. Now what I want you to see is this, that that state that they were in in Jericho is the same state you're in when you walk in. You have the moon over your head, the flesh or the physical, and you have walls up based on your own ideas, theories, and concepts and opinion that you believe are really what reality uh, is or what constitutes reality. Those walls and that lack of knowledge or, or, or light in your heart and mind is what has to be overcome. So here's what happened. Those priests walked around seven days, six days first. Let's talk about that and blew trumpets. The seventh day when they walked around, when the trumpets blew, the people were instructed to shout a mighty shout. When that happened, the walls of Jericho came down. They fell down and they conquered the city. Now, 
What those seven days represent are seven ages and dispensations. And there are seven seals. And in the book of Revelations, the angels asked if anybody was able to open the books and loose the seals. Let's go get that real quick. It's in Revelations, I think, the fourth chapter, if I'm not mistaken. Let me go get it. I'm going to need a fast reader now. I, I can't have you start at one. Revelation 4 1. All right. After well, this, I looked. All right. Go ahead and read. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sue Ellen. Four and one. Four and one. Four and four and one. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as the door of a You know what? I can't I can't get the fourth chapter now because I don't have the time. Go to five like you did like you were planning. Okay. I'm sorry. Five and one. Go ahead. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. All right. And I great. saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Now there's a and question no being asked. There's a question being asked. Who is worthy to open this book and loose the seals? Now what that's talking about is explain what it's what the seven mysteries were or the seven seals. The, in other words, the book was sealed. And it was the mystery of Yahweh's purpose was written in that book, but it was sealed. Nobody knew it. Nobody understood it. Read. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither look thereon. Read. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Mm -hmm. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion, the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now, right there, when he talks about the lion of the tribe of Judah, we obviously understand he's talking about Yahshua the Messiah, who was out of the tribe of Judah. The ensign sign of the tribe of Judah was a lion. And they're saying that he was from the root of David. Now, Yahshua's lineage is run down through your Bible, over there in the book of Luke, and showing that he's coming right out of the kingship tribe of Judah, right from the beginning, and coming down through King David. Now he was worthy to open the book and loose the seals. Read. Six, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as that it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Yahweh sent forth into all the earth. In other words, the Holy Spirit has officiated and operated through seven ages and seven dispensations. And the purpose of Yahweh is a mystery. None of the angels knew the purpose of Yahweh, nor did any man know the purpose of Yahweh. Until Yahshua the Messiah is opening it up and revealing the purpose of Yahweh to us down through the seven ages and seven dispensations. Read. Seven, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the sons. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to Yahweh by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. Read. And hast made us unto our, our Elohim kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Okay. And I beheld, and I, I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. Mm -hmm. saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. 
Mm -hmm. And every creature which is in heaven and on, on the earth and under the earth, and as such are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that lived forever and ever. Now what we got is we got Yahshua opening up the seven seals. Now what I want to do is go back over to the sixth chapter, the sixth chapter of Joshua for a minute. This is the fall of Jericho. And I'll tell you where I want you to go. Hang on for a minute while I get there. Now, we're not going to be able to... Okay, uh, read fast. Start at 1, please. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh said unto Joshua, See, I had given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. Now it's Yahshua the son of Nun that is going to overcome overcome Jericho, which is the moon city that is full of those uh, uh, you know those uh, people that represent those the mystery of iniquity and those demonic spirits. Read. Three, and you shall compass the city, all you men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. Mm -hmm. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the Now those seven, seven times. trumpets and those seven priests represent the seven seals that we were talked about over there in the book of Revelation. That's what it's a manifestation of. And keep reading. And the priests shall blow with the trumpets. trumpets. And they're going to blow those trumpets. It, read. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn... And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before Now, him. after seven days, they're going to do a long blast with the ram's horn. You remember the ram that was slain over there in the story of Abraham offering Isaac? Well, that's a figure of Yahshua, in other words, being slain. And so what we got is that trumpet has to be sounded with a long blast. Now, we have been commanded to go preach the gospel of salvation to the world. This is what all of us have been given a responsibility to be a part of the preaching of the gospel. And so when Yahshua told the apostles, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, when we get on the floor and we preach the gospel, you use these muscles in your cheeks. They're called buccinator muscles. It means trumpeter. So when you speak, it's a combination of your cheek muscles and tongue that are pronouncing the wind as it goes across from your larynx. It's all coming through the same process of the gospel being preached. Every time we get on the floor, ladies and gentlemen, we are sounding the trumpet. And our tongue is involved because in the book of Psalms, David writes that my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Now what happens is when we speak and the true gospel is being preached, the trumpet is, is being uh, uh, sounded and we, as we begin to express the purpose of Yahweh and open up these mysteries, the revelation from Yahshua is writing in your heart and mind an understanding of the mystery of his purpose. Now that revelation is analogous to the flash of the Shekinah that the priest saw after he sprinkled blood seven times at the Ark of the Covenant. Now what's going on there is, is that your all those walls, all those I don't believe this, I don't think this, or I, I, I think it's this way, all of that's going to come down when that's done by the power of the Holy Spirit. The walls are going to come down, and every one of those demonic spirits that are trying to influence you not to listen, don't believe that, just ignore it. All of that is going to be overcome with that mighty shout, which is the name Yahshua. Back there, when they walked around on the seventh day, they shouted a mighty shout, but it does not tell you in there what they shouted. 
They shouted the name of Yahweh. At the last sound of that trump, they shouted Yahweh. Now, under this covenant, the shout is Yahshua. Because this is a name now above every name, that Yahshua, Yahweh, is salvation. So, therefore, we are shouting. We are shouting down those walls in your consciousness. And Yahshua is being made manifest and glorified. And here's what's happening. He's casting out all this demonic spirits in us that cause us to doubt, not to believe, not to accept, uh, not to waste our time going down there. Don't dedicate yourself to that stuff. Worry about, you know, other things in your life that are physical uh, that will give you gratification now. That's what the devil wants you to do. But I want you to know that Joshua, after they took down Jericho, they had to go out through the whole area of Canaan's land and war with all of the tribes and leave none of them to be alive or to continue on. And after the end of that warring that took place where they subdued those tribes and then were at that point they were given their parcel of land that was promised to them in that land of Canaan. And Joshua named where uh, Judah is going to be, where uh, Simeon is going to be, where, uh, you know, Benjamin is going to be, and so on, in that land. Now, in the last chapter of Joshua, the 24th chapter, what he does is he begins to speak, and there's a revelation that is to be had if you read this carefully. Start at 24 and 1. Joshua 24 and 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before Yahweh. Go ahead. And Joshua, said, and Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in, an, in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau, and I gave unto Esau, Mount Seir, to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. Now and listen. afterward, I, and afterward I brought you out. All right, now listen. When you're reading this, here's something we never caught. Dr. Kinley said, and to it says, And Joshua said unto the people, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood. Now, when he says, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and I gave unto you Isaac, Jake, he said that was Joshua telling them essentially who he was, that he was Yahweh Elohim that did all of these things, that he sent Moses uh, also and Aaron. And he said, and, I, and, and listen, Dr. Kinley asked us this question. When Moses was at the burning bush and uh, Yahweh told me he wanted him to go down into Egypt and he said, I can't speak well. Well, he said, I know you can't speak well, Moses, but your brother, your brother Aaron speaks well, doesn't he? He said, yes. Well, he said, go down and meet, go down and meet him. Go down and meet Aaron. The question Doc asked us was, Moses had been in the wilderness for 40 years. He hadn't seen his brother in 40 years. How does he know where to meet him or even what he looks like? Dr. Kinley said that Yahshua, the son of Nun, was down there in Egypt telling Aaron where to go to meet Abraham because it was Yahshua, he said, that appeared in that burning bush to Moses as an angel, telling him where to go to meet Aaron, and Aaron where to go to meet Moses. And that he was the one that did all these things that you're going to read about, that he brought him up out of the land of Egypt, that uh, uh, that he was the one that uh, brought him into the land of the Amorites down in eight. I brought you to the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. At the end of Joshua, Joshua is revealing who he really is. He said, now when the Messiah comes in, he said he's got to fulfill, if he's in the flesh there, where is it and what's it in fulfillment of? 
Because everything he did was a fulfillment of what's in the Law and the Prophets. That's because he's fulfilling when Yahshua the son of Nun was down there in Egypt. And that that was the same Yahshua that now is manifested in the time that we call Yahshua the Messiah. And that Yahweh had been with them all along. And when he said, I know your sufferings, when the Israelites cried unto Yahweh for deliverance, he said, I know your sorrow. He said that's because Yahshua was right down there in the land of Egypt working side by side with them. He knew their travail. He knew their sorrow. And it was him that brought them up out of the land of Egypt. He's the one that split the Red Sea. He's the one that uh, uh, took Moses up into the mountain where he got the vision of revelation and transfigured before Moses. It was him that was in the tent when Yahshua, Moses went in to talk to Yahweh face to face, and it says that a young man named Joshua came not out of the tent. Well, what's Joshua doing in the tent while well, Moses is talking to Yahweh Elohim? Why in 24th chapter of, of Exodus, when Yahweh told Moses to come up alone and by himself, did he go up the mountain with Joshua the son of Nun? That's because it was Joshua, that was Yahweh Elohim manifested in that physical embodiment there that we call Yahshua the son of Nun. And he's revealing himself down there at the end after they have subdued the land and they have gotten their inheritance. Now that's what Yahshua the Messiah has got to come in and fulfill the reality of. He's down at the end of the law. He's going to put an end to the law. He's going to, uh, if you will, uh, 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 he's going to show how that he is, you know, uh, the res resurrection of life, how he's able to bring the dead back, how he's able to heal the sick. All these things that he did, they did not understand until the day of Pentecost, the end of that, the end of that age, that that truly was Yahweh alone walking around in that body of Yahshua the Messiah, doing the same things he did when he was back there with Moses. And it's a great mystery. But the problem is, that we don't understand how the purpose works. Yahshua, that was not the first time he ever was manifested in the flesh when he was came through the loins of the Virgin Mary. So I see my time has expired. Uh, all I can tell you is there's a lot more involved in this whole thing. I wanted you to understand some of the processes of what was going on there in the book of Joshua. It was Yahshua that circumcised them at Gilgal in the fifth chapter also before they went in and get their inheritance because it's Yahshua the Messiah that's going to circumcise your heart and mind now for you to receive the Holy Spirit, which is your inheritance. So I hope it wasn't too confusing. I hope that it came through without breaking up too much. And all I can say is thanks for the opportunity. Peace in Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Now we will be dismissed with the doxology taken from the last few verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Yahweh, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.